You know, everyone, when the moon is in the seventh house and Jupiter aligns with Mars, then love will guide the planets and peace will steer the stars. Because this is the dawning of the age of apocalypse. Age of Apocalypse! Okay, a new expansion, The Age of Apocalypse, has come out. But you know what? Let's let's backtrack a little bit. I kind of like to do these in chronological order because there must be a method to Simon's madness. Quick sidebar, that's something I've always wondered. And if anybody watching knows the answer to this question, please feel free to comment and chime in below. I want to know how they decide which characters or which stretch goals, rather, come first and which come next. You know, what was the decision process behind, okay, first one, Corsair. Anyway, my name is Andrew Fantasia. This is Digital Charcuterie. Please click that thumbs up if you like this. Please click the subscribe and the bell and all that fun stuff. We've been talking about Marvel United for the past couple of weeks. We're going to keep talking about it, and we're going to hopefully keep crossing characters off of my wish list. So with that out of the way, introductions aside, let's talk about what has been revealed since our last video. The first big thing, something we did not expect at all, was the idea of team decks. Now this is really cool. This is something that during my playthroughs throughout the past year, I have played with the idea of taking all the members of a certain team and just putting them together and seeing what that looks like. I haven't made good on that promise just because of the nature of how I personally play Marvel United, which is I do it completely randomly. I assign random number generators and tell me, okay, you're playing these three heroes against this one villain, go. Uh, that way I'm never stuck picking the same people because that would just get super boring to me. I love randomizing, like I just adore it. So I love not knowing what's gonna come up. But now all of a sudden here comes this uh, stretch goal which is a deck of cards for assorted teams. And there's so many of these teams. There's the classic X-Men, there's the uncanny X-Force, there are the Star Jammers, there are Spider Warriors, there's the Avengers, there's the new Avengers, there's the Guardians of the Galaxy, there's the Heroes of Wakanda, there's the Asgardians and allies, so much. And as the campaign has progressed since then, we've unlocked more. There's even a generic team deck specifically tailor-made for characters who don't normally team up together. So theoretically, the way I play, it's always a mishmash of three characters. I could still use this team deck because it's generic if I wanted to play it that way. Andrea Kiravesio said at the top of the month how much he wanted to focus on different ways to play Marvel United. And this campaign has not fallen short on that promise. This is so many more ways I could have possibly imagined to play Marvel United. So great stuff there. Definitely not something I thought of. Probably not something I'm going to use all the time, but a really cool optional buy that actually has me interested. Let's see more of these team decks. Of course, the decks to me are not anywhere near as interesting as the characters we get to unlock. And we finally unlocked. It was a big chunk of time because it was like, what, 70,000 to unlock her? It was insane. But we got Dark Child, our second stretch goal anti-hero. And I talked about it in the last video a little bit. I'll just touch on it again. You know, it's a version of magic being evil and she's, you know, coming from limbo and all that. And it's cool. Definitely not what has me the most excited, but I like this mini. I like having a new anti-hero. The purple minis are fun. So she got unlocked. And then a thing happened. Then it was the dawning of the Age of Apocalypse, baby. Our second revealed expansion box for Marvel United Multiverse is the Age of Apocalypse. First of all, let's talk about the characters we get in this box. Again, it's a great value because for only 35 bucks, you are getting an expansion full of way more stuff than the season one expansions. The expansions in seasons two and three have put the expansions from season one to utter shame. Every time I see these, I look back at like the Tales of Asgard expansion and I'm like, dude, the hell bro? You could have fit like three more people in this box. What are you doing? Age of Apocalypse comes with the following. You get in the blue corner, the heroes, Magneto floating around looking sexy without his helmet, Morph, X-Man, and Sabretooth with Wild Child. And then in the red corner, you've got our three villains, Nemesis with a cool little helmet there, Dark Beast, and the A-Man himself, Apocalypse. 
This is one hell of a groovy box. I like these minis a lot. The Nemesis mini, uh, you're going to be able to remove that bubble from his head if you want to paint his skull. And as a lot of people have pointed out, it's kind of almost a test run for making armor because armor was a big requested mutant character that we didn't get in season two. And considering the vast swath of mutants we have been getting in this stretch goal box, I don't think it's a stretch to say that she's far behind. Get it? Stretch? I'm clever sometimes. All right, so how do I feel about this box, about this expansion? Well, first of all, if you've watched any of these videos, you know I have said this many times, and I'll say it once again, I do not read Marvel Comics. It's just too expensive of a hobby. I never got into it. So Age of Apocalypse is a story that I have zero familiarity with. All I know is Apocalypse is a big meanie, and I only know that because I watched the 90s cartoon. However, I know that this storyline is huge to so many people. X-Men fans, really, just from based on conversations I've had with them, it's like Days of Future Past and Age of Apocalypse are neck and neck for the greatest stories ever told in this pocket of the Marvel Universe. So I'm excited because all those people must be walking on air right now. So I'm so happy that the people who love this storyline get to have this storyline as an expansion box. And I think it's a great fit for Multiverse because the only thing I know about it is that it's not set in 616. It's a multiverse story. It's an alternate universe where stuff went horribly wrong. The characters that get me excited the most in this box, as usual, are the characters that we just do not have yet, period. Because that's how I roll. I like fresh characters more than I like repeat characters. So for me, the number one character in this box that gets my fire burning is Morph, because we have not had Morph yet. I know Morph from the cartoons, so he's a character I'm real familiar with. It's so nice to add Morph to the roster. And then you've got someone like Nemesis, who I've never heard of, but I like that mini, and I don't have that character yet. I also did not buy the Horseman of the Apocalypse box last season because it did not seem like the greatest value, uh, you know, compared to something like the Galactus box, which has so many different modes in it. The Apocalypse box did not really have that much to offer for me. So I don't have the Purple Apocalypse. I don't have him. And even though I think his sculpt, his little figure is more classic looking than this Age of Apocalypse one, I'm excited at the prospect of finally getting an Apocalypse to use. I heard the original one was really hard to fight. I don't know what this one's going to be like. Dark Beast, on the other hand. Dark Beast looks like an insanely fun villain. He's a character I've been aware of for many, many years, and I didn't think we would ever get him in this game, but we did, and I know a lot of fans are happy about that, because he's a big Age of Apocalypse character, apparently. X-Man, though. Damn, this figure looks so cool. This is definitely my favorite figure in the whole bunch. Look, he's got the lightning effects. We talked about fire and water effects and how much I like those, and now there's lightning effects? Dear Lord, take my money. So that's the Age of Apocalypse box in a nutshell. Uh, it's going to also come with all different locations, obviously, and all kinds of stuff, but what a great expansion to add to the list. And I want to bring something up before we move on, because this is something that really makes me exciting, really makes me excited. I can't talk anymore. That's how excited I am. And it's something I brought up before, which is a question I asked where I asked, are these expansions going to have the multiverse banner on the box, or are they going to be all over the place with different banners because such is the nature of the multiverse? And it looks like it's option B. And that really excites me. We had the Galactus box, which said Fantastic Four, and that's what got me thinking about this whole thing. The Inhumans box just said War of Kings, so it was its completely own thing. It didn't say multiverse at all. And then along comes this one, that technically you could put the multiverse logo on the banner, but instead they chose to put the X-Men logo. So this is really, really exciting for me. This is so much fun because it's just a box of chocolates. Every time they pull another expansion out from under the Simon magic table of goodies, I never know what's going to come up on that box. I never know if that banner is going to say multiverse or, you know, another X-Men one or, dear God, fingers crossed, a Spider-Man or Hulk expansion, right? Something like that. This whole plane fast and loose with the banners is super cool, and I hope that they keep doing it. Thanks to the outstanding outcry of surprise and joy from the Age of Apocalypse box, no one was surprised when we very quickly... Bada bing, bada boom, unlocked Aurora, a member of Alpha Flight who was missing from the original roster as a Canadian man. I find this exciting. Now, apparently all we need is a character named Shaman, who I don't know about yet, but he's apparently a super important member of Alpha Flight. People are clamoring for Shaman. If they give us Shaman, 
boom, we get a full team. Aurora is also North Star's sister. So I'm curious. I'm, I'm, I really want to get my hands on the cards and see what they can do. I wonder if she's got any sort of back and forth that she can do if North Star is there with her. The next character we unlocked is another mutant character. Put your skin together for Husk because she is not doing that she's actually taking her skin apart. She's doing the opposite. Husk can pull her skin off and do all kinds of cool things with it. And she's like Colossus, but instead of just metal, everything. She's like, oh, you want metal skin? How about fire skin? That's a really cool concept for a mutant. I've never heard of her, but she is apparently part of Generation X, who were a bunch of youths who were all like broody teens and they full of angst and stuff. Husk is part of that group. And again, like the Alpha Flight group and Star Jammers, it's another team that a lot of people wanted to fill out. And that's what I love. I love the idea of filling out a roster, right? There are so many people out there who were like, please fill out Generation X and fill out Alpha Flight. And they're doing that. I'm on this side of the fence where I'm rooting for other teams, mainly those teams that I want, the little flags that I'm waving to be filled out are Spider-Man villains and Hulk adjacent characters. So, I'm waving those two flags proudly over here, and I'm so happy for the people who really wanted Alpha Flight and who really wanted Generation X, because you got them. So now, I hope my turn is next, because I really want some Hobgoblin action, and more on that later, actually. After Husk, we revealed the third Kickstarter anti-hero, and he was unlocked. Mr. U.S. Agent John Walker himself, the U.S. Agent, is a purple character that we are gonna get in this glorious promo box. And finally, for the first time in what feels like quite a while, I get to check a character off my list because I had US Agent as not only an anti-hero, but a stretch goal anti-hero. So he is exactly where and when and how and who I predicted him to be. Very happy about this. Very happy to see U.S. Agent, and he gives me hope for another team that a lot of people seem to be clamoring for, which is the Thunderbolts. So maybe that's coming next. I don't know. What's cool about this is, again, they're so creative with the villains this season. Because he thinks he's such a hero, he actually doesn't have villain master plan cards. He just has a normal hero deck, and you use that every time you're supposed to draw a villain card. Whoever is designing the way these villains are operating, every one of them feels so unique this season. I'm really impressed. And I hope I can do half as good a job in a few minutes when I reveal to you my idea for how a certain villain would potentially utilized. Finally, shortly after, or shortly before, I can't remember the timing, John Walker was unlocked, we got the news that one of the previous expansions is in fact going to be made available to people who missed out. As a person who discovered Kickstarter the way I discovered it, I, I promise this tangent will not be long, but I love Ghostbusters. And one of my best friends also loves Ghostbusters. And one day he's like, hey, Andrew, check out this game I got. And it was the Ghostbusters board game by Cryptozoic that was a Kickstarter board game. And I said, oh my God, I want that. Can I, can I buy it too? And he said, well, no, it was on Kickstarter. So eventually you'll be able to get the retail release, but it won't have everything that's in this. That was how I discovered Kickstarter board games. And the idea that I missed out on that Ghostbusters game still kind of gnaws at me every once in a while. I utterly empathize with anybody who's a big Marvel fan who just discovered Marvel United now and can't get their hands on all the goodies that have come in seasons one and two. So the fact that Simon was kind enough to offer the Fantastic Four box completely as it was before with no extra features so they don't pressure people to feel like they have to double dip, but just made available for other fans so that they can get their hands primarily on the Silver Surfer Mini that's gonna tie in with Galactus. That deserves one of these. Simon, you're beautiful and I love what you're doing. Coming on the heels of this news was the fact that they are going to add three special extra cards to the Galactus box, which will allow you to swap out Silver Surfer as one of the Heralds in both Galactus mode and Herald mode. And this to me is so much better than just having a stretch goal down the road that's just a red Silver Surfer mini, because that would have been kind of lame. This way, everybody wins. Everybody wins with this announcement. And that has taken us to the present day where we are 
waiting on pins and needles to unlock Lalandra as our next character. If she gets unlocked, I get to check her off my list because she's there too. But right now, before we end things, as a little bonus for all of you, something I've been talking about in these videos is ideas I have had for how to implement some characters into the game. Initially I had ideas for Chameleon and then they announced Chameleon and it was similar but of course better because they are more experienced game designers than me. So I'm not going to show you my Chameleon idea, whatever, but what I will show you is the idea I had for how to implement Hobgoblin as a villain. He is my second favorite Spider-Man villain after the Kingpin, so I am really pulling to see some Hobgoblin action. And I wanted to come up with a unique, interesting take on him that wouldn't just feel like Green Goblin with a different mini. What I came up with is this. In the comic books, the infamous sort of thing that Hobgoblin is known for is that there was just no clear, definitive answer as to who he was. The creator had one idea, the writer had another idea, the editor had another idea, and at some point or another, all of them became the right answer until the next one came along, and it was just a huge, big, fat, wet, steamy, orange mess. So to me, because he has this whole idea of being a mystery character, I decided that the Hobgoblin villain setup would be almost like Marvel United meets Clue. Here's how it works. Hobgoblin will come with a deck of six Unmask cards. And each card features one of six characters from the comics who were Hobgoblin at one point in time. That would be Roderick Kingsley, Daniel Kingsley, Ned Leeds, Jason McIndale, Phil Ulrich, and Lefty Donovan. So every time you play Hobgoblin, the identity of the man behind the Hobgoblin mask is going to be one of these six dudes, and it's going to be different every time, just like a game of Clue. At the start of the game, you would have to shuffle these cards, place one of them face down on Hobgoblin's dashboard. That one is his true identity. Then you set the rest of them aside as an unmasked deck, and you place one crisis token in each location except the hero's starting location. Once a threat has been cleared, any hero in that location can spend one heroic action to remove the crisis token and flip over the top card in the unmasked deck. This represents process of elimination detective work. This represents them flipping over the top card and saying, okay, the top card is Phil Ulrich, so we know that the Hobgoblin is not Phil Ulrich because this is not the card that's on his dashboard. And once you finally flip over the entire unmasked deck, then you will know who Hobgoblin actually is. Now, here's where it takes an interesting twist, because that alone does not make for a great villain battle. So I decided, based on just the Hobgoblin I know and grew up with and fell in love with, which is the one from the animated series, I decided that this Hobgoblin is a very destructive fellow, and that leads to the main special rule here, which is this. The heroes lose if Hobgoblin is defeated before he is unmasked. This happened in the comics. We lost Hobgoblin before we got the concrete answer of who he was. So the way I look at it is you lose if you make the same mistakes that the comics did. The objective is to not do that. The objective is to get the right answer before Hobgoblin is dead. So that's where we start to diverge from normal villains. Hobgoblin's health doesn't increase when you have more characters, it actually decreases. He starts with 12 if you have two heroes, 11 if you have three heroes, and 10 health if you have four heroes. And most of the threat cards and master plan cards are going to do damage to Hobgoblin as well as to the heroes, because he's running around throwing pumpkin bombs and causing massive explosions, so he's his own worst enemy. He's a destructive mercenary. His overflow rule would simply place a master plan card face down in the storyline. I know that's an easy way out, but I just went with that. His bam will deal two damage to each hero in Hobgoblin's location, and then you would move Hobgoblin to the next clockwise location. He zips around on his glider. His threat cards would be as follows. Two of them are pumpkin bombs. Heroes that take damage in this location would take one extra damage. Another two would be SWAT teams. Whenever Hobgoblin lands there, he takes one damage. So the SWAT teams are going to shoot at him. Collateral damage is another threat. Whenever a hero takes damage here, Hobgoblin also takes one damage. He's destroying buildings and rubble is flying everywhere. So he's hurting the heroes, but he's also hurting himself because he's a maniac. And then finally, panicked civilians would be the last threat. 
Civilians in this location require two heroic actions to be rescued. They're panicking because Hobgoblin's just blowing a lot of stuff up. And then I didn't plan out any of his master plan cards, but again, a lot of them would involve him taking damage as well as dishing it out to the heroes. So you're in a race against time to uncover all of the mask cards to find out who he really is before he does himself in or before the SWAT teams take him out because then just like the comics, you will end up with a dead hobgoblin and no answer to the mystery of who's behind the mask. I just thought that would be a fun, unique way to handle what I think is a very fun, unique character. Then I also had another idea for something that I don't even know if we're going to get, but it fits the multiverse theme. It's just something that I have wanted to see happen in Marvel United since season one, and we haven't seen it yet. So this is a thought I had for what they could do with Mobius. Being part of the TVA, you know, it makes sense that Mobius would be different. He would be special. He would utilize the multiverse and time in general to his advantage, and that's important. This is what I had in mind for Mobius, and it's not so much a playable character as it is more like a different mode you can play, kind of like the Deadpool on the Unicorn mode. A Mobius mode would be that as well. Maybe he can also be a playable character, why not? But this is what I had in mind, and it's a bit more complicated, so I'm just going to show you at the table instead. So follow me. Okay, so first of all, forgive the lighting here, but uh, okay, so we have Magneto. Uh, I'm just going to use him as an example. Pretend he's Mobius, just because I have something set up here already. So Magneto is Mobius, and in this case, I don't have him interacting with any of the locations, because he's a time traveler from another dimension. Instead, he moves on the timeline itself, just like this. So he is moving through time. And what happens is he'll have a deck, kind of like this, with a movement symbol on it, like the master plan. So for example, a two, he would move two spaces on the storyline. And then whatever card he lands on, he would actually start at the beginning because that makes more sense. But then whatever card he lands on, so if he moves one, two, whoops, he's drunk. He would interact with Luke Cage's card. So for example, maybe you could use one of the symbols on whatever card he lands on, but only with that character. Sort of to represent like he's time traveling to back when Luke Cage performed that action and maybe helping him do it again in a different way. And maybe if he lands on a villain card, something bad might happen to the heroes to sort of, you know, balance things out. So that's what I'm thinking of for Mobius. It's definitely not as fleshed out as the Hobgoblin thing, but yeah, it fits the multiverse theme. Mobius, there we go. Move on the storyline. All right, yeah, so that's Mobius mode. I don't know if it'll work. Maybe it will, maybe it won't, but it would honestly be something interesting and cool to try that would really fit the theme of multiverse. And that's all the time we have for today. What an exciting few days it's been for this campaign. I can't wait to see what expansions come out next. Just bring them all, bring them all. Uh, I had another idea for a very different expansion that would probably never happen, but maybe I'll talk about it in a future video. Until then, Thank you so much for watching, everybody. Stay excited for this game because there's a lot to be excited about. And I'll see you all next time for whatever's coming up next in the Master Plan.